Hello, everyone. Welcome to 585 Political Economy. My name is Dr. Powell, and I'll be your instructor for the course. And so I thought I'd present a um, overview of the course here in week one and kind of tell you some of the topics we'll be talking about, give you an introduction to myself, and then an introduction to some of your assignments here in the first week of the course. So here in political economy, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at the public intervention in the economy. And we'll talk about some of the reasons for public intervention in the economy. We'll talk about some of the reasons why the public sector will sometimes displace private sector resources in the provision and or production of some goods and services. And not only the rationale, but some of the consequences for public production and provision of goods and services. The primary textbook you have for this course is the Eco Economics of the Public Sector by Rosengard. We'll provide you with a good overview of all those types of issues in terms of public provision and production of goods. Uh, in the second part of the class, we'll then get into certain types of policy, such as welfare policy and education policy. And we'll talk about what it means for having government provision and production of those types of goods and services. Each week, as you're probably familiar with being in the program and having courses in the program before, we list all the assignments for each week uh, in each of our weekly modules. Uh, you will have, in addition to the readings from the primary textbook, you'll then also have some videos provided for you that you can watch. You'll also have uh, weekly overview lectures from me and PowerPoint slides that you can also view to acclimate yourself to some of the material and some of the concepts that we'll be talking about uh, in each weekly learning activity. Each week, you'll be doing a series of different types of assignments, and the type of assignment you'll be doing will depend upon the week in which you are doing it. Most weeks, we'll have a discussion board assignment, and discussion board assignments come in two different varieties. There are text-based, and there are also multimedia discussion board assignments. Again, if you've been in the program for a while, you have done these multimedia discussion board assignments before, or you'll be preparing and then uploading a video into discussion board. Uh, you'll have some of those, and then some of your remaining discussion board assignments will be text only types of discussion boards. So a total of six of those discussion boards, 75 points each for a total of 450 points. You then have writing assignments, each worth 100 points. You will also have a reflective journal assignment, and then finally, as you do with all the courses in the MPA program, you will then have a culminating critical assignment that's due at the end of the term. And that critical culminating assignment is worth 200 points. All assignments need to be submitted by the due date. And you'll see in the syllabus and in each one of the weekly activity areas, you'll see the due dates for each relevant assignment. Any assignment that's turned in after the due date will be assessed a 10% penalty for each day that it is late. Nothing's accepted past the first week uh, after it is due, and late work will not be accepted after the last day of class. So true, do try and get everything turned in on time so you can avoid that 10% late penalty. I do realize that in addition to your coursework, you also have other obligations such as family obligations, work obligations, uh, church obligations. And so if wife does intervene and it makes it difficult for you to adhere to a due date, please let me know that in advance. Just send me an email, let me know what's going on, and then we can always make provisions to try and get you an extension so that you can avoid that 10% late penalty. Well, let me tell you a little bit about myself and what I do here at Cal Baptist and where I've come from. Currently here at Cal Baptist, I am an adjunct instructor, and so I typically teach courses such as this course, the political economy course. I routinely teach organization theory. On occasion, I'll also teach public personnel management, so kind of a jack of all trades in the MPA program. My full-time position is at Cal State Long Beach, where I've been for the past 22 years as a full-time faculty member. 10 of those 22 years I spent as department chair and I guess now I'm up to about 17 years now that I've been the director of the distance learning MPA program as well at Cal State Long Beach. You'll see all the pictures on the screen represent uh, all the institutions I've either gone to or institutions that I have taught at. The top left on the screen is Baldwin Wallace University. That was my undergraduate institution located just outside of Cleveland, Ohio. I got a 
bachelor's degree in political science and a bachelor's degree in history at Baldwin Wallace. Second picture up there in the middle of the screen is overhead shot of the mall at Ohio State University where I went uh, while I was working on my master's degree. Received a master's degree then from Ohio University and that picture there is of Cutler Hall on uh, uh, the green at Ohio University. And the one on the top right is Miami University where I got my PhD in political science and that's a picture of Harrison Hall which is the home of the Department of Political Science named after Benjamin Harrison, former president of the United States. So that's where I did all of my undergraduate and graduate level work. Uh, as soon as I received my PhD at Miami, I got my first teaching job a couple of months later at Eastern Illinois University. And at the bottom left of the screen, you'll see that's a building called Old Main on the campus of Eastern Illinois University in lovely scenic Charleston, Illinois. I taught in the political science department at Eastern Illinois for four years. Then I moved on to sunny Florida and went down to Fort Myers, Florida, where they were starting up a new MPA program at Florida Gulf Coast University. And that's the picture you see there in the middle of the screen. Uh, Florida Gulf Coast University was a new university when I got there. It had been open only four years, a brand new MPA program. I uh, had the opportunity to start a bachelor's program in political science while I was there. Then got an opportunity to move out here to California at Cal State Long Beach. And I arrived on the campus of Cal State Long Beach in 2001 and settled in and have been there ever since. So that's kind of my educational background, both where I've gone to school and also where I have taught at. Uh, in addition to my academic uh, pursuits, I also have served on a local school board. I did that for six years in Santa Clarita. Uh, my term ended in 2020, so had a lot of opportunity to take a lot of the theories that I teach in the classroom and to apply those theories in a practical situation. We were a um, school district of about 10,000 students with 15 schools and an operating budget of about $150 million. So it was a good experience to do a lot of uh, application of a lot of the theories and concepts that I got from my academic background. So that's kind of me uh, as an introduction. Uh, you can always contact me via email if you have any questions at all about the course. I'm always available, uh, and I, I hope you do enjoy uh, the course. I'm sure I will enjoy working with you. What we will be covering in this very first week of the course is an introduction to political economy, an introduction to public sector economics. So from your primary textbook, you have the first two chapters assigned, chapter one, defining the public sector, and chapter two, measuring public sector size. What we'll be looking at from those chapters is we'll try to get a handle on, again, some of the reasons why we have public intervention in the economy. We'll talk about why government gets involved in the provision and production of public goods, uh, sometimes uh, toll and collective pool goods and sometimes even in regulation of private goods as well. We know that for the most part, we have a history in this country of what Adam Smith referred to as the invisible hand, where we tend to defer to the private sector and we allow the private sector to do a lot of provision and production of goods and services. And the public sector then gets involved whenever the private sector fails to provide or produce goods or services that are deemed necessary by society. But whenever the public sector gets involved in the provision and or production of goods and services, the public sector is displacing private sector resources. So we need to make sure that whenever we do have public intervention in the economy, that the value of that public intervention is greater than the value of the private sector resources that are being displaced. So, you know, for instance, if we have privatization of prisons, and we decide we're going to privatize some aspects of the production provision of prisons. Well, typically, you know, we would normally have the public sector doing that. When we have the private sector then introduced to do it through privatization, again, there needs to be a value that comes from that private intervention. Just like if we would have the public sector then step in and take over a private sector activity, the value of the public intervention must at least equal or exceed the value of private provision and or production. So we really need to achieve that balance depending upon which sector is providing and producing the good or the service. So we'll define 
instances where the public sector gets involved in provision and or production. And we'll talk about the, the growth that we have seen in terms of government intervention in the economy. As you're probably aware, if you've taken some history courses, you probably know that the federal government began to get very involved in the regulation of the economy in the late 1800s. We had the creation of things such as the Interstate Commerce Commission. We had the regulation not only of interstate commerce, but of railroads. We had the regulation of workplace safety. We had the regulation of food quality. We had the regulation of the quality of pharmaceutical medications. And throughout the late 1800s into the early 1900s, we saw this great expansion in terms of government regulation and involvement in the economy. Then we had the Great Depression. And as a response to that Great Depression, FDR introduced his New Deal and all these what we call alphabet agencies, all these new agencies and programs that were created to try and help people climb out of the depths of the Great Depression. Whenever we had the creation of all these programs and all these agencies, we then had a further expansion of federal government involvement into the economy through the use of grants and mandates. And we again see this expansion. We oftentimes see government expansion into the private sector and into the economy as a result of a crisis. It's a response to a crisis. So, you know, we saw a great expansion of the federal government after the Civil War, that type of a crisis. We saw a great expansion of the federal government in the New Deal as a response to the crisis of the Great Depression. The interesting phenomenon, though, when you're looking at government intervention in the economy is that, yes, government intervention usually occurs as a response to a crisis, but once that crisis has passed, we rarely see the level of government intervention decline. Typically, the level of government intervention remains at that heightened level even after a crisis has been mitigated and dealt with. One of the reasons for that is what we refer to as expectancy theory, that once government gets involved in the economy and starts providing and producing goods and services, people come to expect that government will continue to produce and provide those goods and services. Those heightened expectations on the part of the public will then be the impetus for government to continue providing and producing those goods and services. And that is why rather than seeing the level of government intervention go down after a crisis has been averted, we see it remain the same and actually even increase as we move into the next crisis that needs to be addressed. So expectancy theory is a good explanation for why the size and scope of government intervention and the size and scope of the public sector has tended to increase over the years. And again, make no mistake, as the government gets more involved in the provision and production of goods and services, government budgets become bigger, government agency employment, employment roles will become bigger, and the overall size of the public sector will certainly increase. So we'll talk about a lot of those issues as you read chapters one and two in your textbook. You also have some videos that are provided to you in the week one uh, resources as well, looking at things such as scarcity and the impact of scarcity on government intervention, as well as opportunity costs. And this economic idea of an opportunity cost being that if you are going to put public resources behind one project or behind one program, it means those government resources are no longer available to be used for another program or another project. That's an opportunity cost. So what opportunities are you giving up by deciding to put public resources behind a specific program or a specific project? Uh, so we'll, the, that video will discuss those opportunity costs and some of the ways in which we can measure those opportunity costs and include them in our decision-making calculus about whether or not government should be involved in the provision and production of a good or service, as well as the extent of that government intervention and government involvement. Uh, then you also uh, have some other videos, specialization in trade, and some other videos that are provided for you in those weekly activities as well. So in this first week, what we will be doing 
you'll be completing a discussion board. And this first discussion board is a multimedia discussion board. And the discussion board post is due on Saturday. And then responses to your classmates are then due on Sunday. You've probably, again, done these multimedia discussion boards before in the program. But if not, there are narrated presentations that you will create these videos. You'll then upload your video to YouTube or Vimeo or whatever hosting site that you prefer to use. And then you'll embed that video into the discussion board. Uh, you'll need to make sure that your embedded link is working, that the actual video works. Um, if not, uh, you can refer to the how-to video that's provided for you in the week one activity section. Uh, so you can learn how to put these multimedia discussion boards together. But again, I think the vast majority of people have already done it, and you're probably familiar with doing those multimedia types of posts. In addition to posting your multimedia discussion board, you will then also respond to at least two other students welcome to the class or commenting on the content of their video or the production quality of their video. Again, your responses to classmates should always be professional, they should always be courteous, and they should always be constructive in nature. So they should push the discussion forward. Then you also have a journal entry assignment this week as well that's due on Sunday. For this journal entry assignment, you will informally interview a minimum of three friends or family members and ask them the following questions. And again, this is informal, so this is nothing that you need to get IRB approval for. Uh, it's not a formal uh, research project. You're just asking three friends or family members. Number one, do they feel that the federal government impacts the economy in a positive or a negative way? Try to probe a bit to find out if they can offer a specific example. Number two, how do they think we should decide which activities should be done by the government and which should be done by the private sector? And then number three, do they feel the federal government should intervene more or less in the economy and why? So just getting a general anecdotal sense from some folks you know about what they think about government intervention, how positive government intervention is, um, how much government intervention there should be, and you know how do we decide what types of goods and services should belong to the public sector and be provided and produced by the public sector versus what should be provided and produced by the private sector. And again, that is going to be the primary focus of this first week of the course, trying to delineate those boundaries between public sector and private sector in terms of political economics. So that's your first week. Um, I hope you enjoy the material for this week. I look forward to reading your discussion board posts as well as your journal entries. Again, if you have any questions at all as we move through this week, feel free to contact me, send me an email. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Look forward to working with everyone and I'll speak to you again in week two with our week two overview video. So take care and have a great week.